So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Sasha Volberg uh, here with us. And uh, Sasha graduated uh, at the, um, St. Petersburg a few years ago. And uh, he's been recipient of many international prizes, in particular, among others, the Salem Prize. He's been uh, an invited speaker at the ICM. He's author of countless many papers, uh, more than 200 in analysis, and he's always been one of the most prolific in solving deep, long-standing problems. And uh, again, it's a great pleasure to have him here, and I'll, I'll let him say his title of his talk. Thank you. Should I put it? Oh, well, yes, yes. Here, around the... Like this? Anywhere. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. So, um, for several years ago, I started to be very um, interested in a certain part of harmonic analysis because it was exciting, it was strange, and uh, it seemingly had applications to very many different areas. And this is a harmonic analysis. on Hamming cube. So Hamming cube is just minus 1, 1 to the power n. So let us denote it omega 2 n. So a string of symbols minus 1, 1. So these are just vertices of the cube in very high dimensional space. So this n is astronomically big. And um, uh, many things which, well, most of the things which people want to do for this uh, type of functions or operators on this thing is to prove estimates which do not depend on n. And so uh, let's see what we have here. We have integration. Integration is denoted, so we have functions, first of all. Functions uh, can be functions, just real valued, complex valued, Banach space valued, or, which is very interesting, this can be functions uh, with just two values, minus one and one. It's a Boolean functions. Or, also right, quite interesting, it can be bounded functions. I will just say that these are functions from the Hamming cube to say minus one one or two zero one doesn't matter some uh, interval and um, in the case when for example these are functions from from Hamming cube to zero one these are the creatures which happen to be very often in what is super fashionable now uh, it's um, quantum computing algorithms because this f would mean a certain thing which is called accept, accepting probability of a certain algorithm. So what kind of things we have? If, uh, we have integration, so it's just uh, 1 over 2 to the n, and just then the sum of f epsilon, and epsilon, uh, it's not small number, it's just strings of symbols epsilon 1, epsilon 2, et cetera. Each epsilon is plus or minus. Uh, sometimes I will call them epsilon, sometimes just x. And then x is still, x1 is plus minus 1, x2 is plus minus 1. We have also de de derivatives. Uh, let me, um, maybe before saying what is derivative, which of course I can do immediately, <coughs> can say that we have Fourier transform. Um, this symbol means the following. U S is a subset of 1, 2, N, any subset. And for example, if S is, I don't know, 1, 3,000, <coughs> then x to the s 
would mean x1 times x3 or epsilon. This is x and epsilon I will choose. I will use interchangeably. So just product of axes with corresponding coordinates. Yes. Uh, notice that this is, of course, polynomial of at least 2,000 variables, but, uh, well, three variables, but, I mean, 2,000, because others are not here, but they are still, you can think that they're here. But, um, but there is no polynomial which has, for example, x1 squared. So all polynomials on Humming cube are just products of variables. They cannot be cubed, they cannot be squared. Square is identically one, cube is identically x. Okay, so um, each function will have Fourier representation, which looks like this. Uh, and summation is over all subsets of one, two, three, etc. n. And so all functions on Humming cube are just polynomials. Um, of degree n, n is huge, and um, they are all multilinear. So they are linear in each variable. <clears throat> so in this definition, if we believe this, uh, this is called, of course, Fourier coefficient, and it can be easily computed from f, as always, f s is just integration of f times s. My, my f's are, yeah, so that's, that's the Fourier coefficient. And um, so uh, there is derivative, which is exactly what we used to do. It's, it's a partial derivative in ith variable. So just honest partial derivative. Uh, but there is another derivative. which is this partial derivative multiplied by this variable. And for this one, there is another formula. So it's uh, f of x minus f of xi divided by 2. What does it mean, i? It means you look at your string of symbols, find the eth place, and just flip it. If it was plus 1 here, make it minus 1. It was minus 1, make it plus 1. So it's a difference along the edge of the cube. Uh, so we have these discrete derivatives. Uh, we have integration. We have gradient, which is um, d1f, just vector dnf. Uh, we have absolute value of the gradient, which is the sum of half. Um, also, we have um, so-called influences. Now, for Boolean function, uh, the influence can be understood in the following way. It's a probability. Uh, so it's a portion of x among our vertices such that f of x is not equal to f x i. This is why it's influence. So it's the influence of the ith variable. Um, okay, so uh, let's compute some of these things. So if you honestly compute this eth influence, um, in terms of Fourier coefficients, 
Planche rail, more or less, uh, of this. Um, and then, if you, uh, I didn't say that if you sum up all the influences, it is called total influence. So it's total influence. And let's sum up these things and use uh, just use uh, uh, change of possibility to change uh, the order of summation. And if we change the order of summation, we immediately see that the total influence. So, to, so to speak, L two influence because we have all this two. So. Um, Total influence is, is this, and uh, <clears throat> for example, if the degree of our polynomial is less or equal than d, what does it mean? It means that, in principle, these are polynomials of the highest degree is n, because you can multiply x1, x2, etc., xn. But uh, each of these monomials has, has a degree, right? This one, for example, has degree 3. And uh, so we take the monomial with the largest degree, and this is the degree of our polynomial. And suppose we have this. Uh, by the way, what is that? It's, it's the cardinality of set S. And degree means that cardinality will be at most D. Uh, and if our function is Boolean, so we are left with the sum of squares, but by Planchereel, it's the integral of f squared, and the function has only values plus or minus one, so it's just one. Or if the function would be not Boolean, it would be between like minus one and one, it's still sum of squares of Fourier coefficients is the integral of f squared, and it's, it's bounded by one, so it will be still this, this estimate. Uh, all right, and here is the first funny thing. So suppose we compute influences in another metric. metric L1. And the total influence, again, the sum of these guys. And again, suppose that degree F is less than D. So is there estimate like here that the influence is uh, bounded by the degree times L infinity norm. Okay, yes, there is. Um, Nobody knows the linear estimate. So there is d cube here, or even I think some paper improved it to d squared. And um, it's a very, very uh, non trivial result. And um, so, application of this result, a certain urdus. Uh, Max Cut theorem for graphs. Why I'm saying that? I'm not going to cite Erdős uh, Goldberg Patch theorem for graphs. Um, because it will take too much time. I'm doing that by 
sort of emphasizing that if we look at the gradient f in L1, we go to graph theory. So when you consider estimates independent of n, uh, in when your gradient is taken in L1 norm, you suddenly, it's not the only example, it suddenly becomes some results about graph theory. Um, okay, uh, how about, why, why L1? Well, how about something else? So, um, Suppose we still like like this thing. And we think about L2. So what kind of, um, I mean, L2 of the gradient, not, not necessarily like L, L2 norms of, of the derivatives. Uh, so the estimate itself can be, can be in LP, but the, the gradient should be in L2. Okay, so for example, Poincare inequality. So what is Poincare inequality? Let's consider the simplest case. Uh, real valued functions on, on the cube and um, so you look at the following estimate. As I said, it can be P, but the gradient should be L2 gradient, meaning you take uh, squares of these guys and sum them up and take square root. Unlike there, it was sums of just absolute values without square and square root. So it's like L1 theory, this is L2 theory. So this is the usual gradient, but of course we're interested in this uh, Poincare type estimate. And for P equals two, the constant CP is one, which is uh, again, something like Planchereal theorem. It's very easy. Uh, but suppose P is one. So we are looking at, at this inequality and uh, we want a sharp constant. Oh, by the way, in no other cases except P equals two, the sharp constant is no, none of the cases. So let's, let's look at C equals one, uh, P equals one. So what was known? So this result was known, pi over two, uh, and it was proved by Francoise Luce Picard. And the two things uh, sort of um, jump into your eyes when you, you read her paper. One thing is that for Gaussian functions, for Gaussian case, Now, uh, let me explain what is Gaussian case. For Gaussian case, the constant is square root of pi over two, and it is sharp. So what does mean Gaussian case? You, you consider now functions not on the Hamming cube, because what does mean function on the Hamming cube? It's a function of Bernoulli variables. So independent plus minus one variables, you consider function of Bernoulli. So in fact, we are, the language of probability is better here. So uh, Gaussian means that you consider the function of Gaussian variables. So it's, still, it's a function of x1, x2, xn, which are now just in R, real valued, but the underlying measure is Gaussian. So all integrals are Gaussian integrals. Uh, all derivatives are usual derivatives, usual partial derivatives of what a function. Function is absolutely normal function of n variables. 
uh, only when you integrate, you integrate with Gaussian measure. And because there are n variables, the estimate does, should not depend on n. That's claim for fame. And uh, it turns out that, yes, it doesn't depend on n, and sharp constant is pi over 2, a square root of pi over 2. And function f, which gives this, like, which are functions s, which, which give us this constant. There is no one function f, but the functions which almost give us this constant, eventually give it, are just uh, characteristic functions of half spaces in Rn. Characteristic functions, of course, cannot be differentiated, but if you smoothen it up and make it more and more sharp, this smoothing, it, it will go to square root of pi over two. So when I saw this, this pi over two, it was very strange. Why it was very strange? Because central limit theorem says that sum of Bernoulli variables, if you normalize it correctly, becomes Gaussian. So in other words, if one would prove this one with square root of pi over 2, then automatically one would have this result of Gilles Pizier for Gaussian. So the world of Bernoulli is more complicated and more deep than the world of Gaussian. Uh, the second thing, which was very strange in this proof, that even though it's absolutely elementary fact about functions on a rather simple object, the proof was fantastic. The proof had nothing to do with functions. They, she immediately invented a certain um, thing which threw the functions into the world of infinitely big matrices, and she used uh, operator theory to prove this result. So I was completely hooked by this, and uh, I thought we should do something, maybe find the sharp constant. <clears throat> so to, let me write here what she used, non-commutative harmonic analysis. This is completely commutative thing. Why one should use non-commutative harmonic analysis is still not clear to me. And actually, after thinking for quite a lot of time, so um, we prove this in quote. So we means, uh, so it's, my former student, Atri Vanishvili, who is Greek, by the way, um, Ramon Van Handel, and just to move this pi over two a little bit down, just by showing that pi over two was a wrong constant we need to invent a certain formula. Relating and even though this formula was rather elementary, uh, nobody wrote it before us. And it turned out that this formula can be used in a solution. of most problem. So around 
69, maybe, or 60 something, or 71, uh, Pierre and Flo ask the following question. <clears throat> so for that, we need to remind what is Banach space of type. P, it's um, Uh, here, it's important to use epsilon i for variable on Banach or on Hamming cube because x i are taken. These are vectors in the Banach space. Every n. Power P. So you, you take any vectors in the Banach space with any amount of vectors, n vectors, and um, you, you take uh, this uh, function on Hamming cube with, with values in the Banach space. This F, this is F. values in the Banach space. And so you you integrate this this function, the absolute norm of this function to the power P. And on the right you have notice that Xi, so if we derivate partial derivative is exactly Xi. So here we have a function, here we have sum of partial derivatives. Uh, so this is the definition of type. And then there was the definition of a flow type. Take any function. So this function is not any function. It's a linear function on, on Q. So a flow type says take any F and do the following. Well, he formulated slightly differently, but it's the same thing. Maybe another CP. So on the first glance, this second line is, of course, more general than this line because you just take a special F. <clears throat> and so the question was, well, this is a trivial arrow, and the question was about non-trivial arrow. And of course, on the first glance, it seems completely idiotic. How it can be that if something is true for linear function, it's true for all polynomials? So there were many efforts to prove it. Uh, they were proved for some special classes of Banach spaces, but in general it was not known. And uh, so we, using this formula which I explained, uh, uh, we proved this in, in yes. And on, on the road, it was sort of like L2, maybe I'm, a little bit non-precise here, but it was sort of sort of L2 gradients. Well, I, 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 I wish to be more precise, but I don't have time. So let us, so gradient F in L1, graph theory, gradient F in L2, which also has not only this example, but many other examples. Let's call it Banach space theory. Yeah, 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 but when you take absolute value, it doesn't matter. Oh. The absolute has a plus minus one. Uh, 
And now I want to say something about uh, what if we look at these influences What about Ellen Fields? So basically what we're interested in is what is the importance of, of this thing? Maximum influence. Especially for special types of functions. So Boolean or bounded. <clears throat> and here, the following effect takes place. So imagine that we have a Boolean function on Hamming cube, a Boolean function of Boolean variables. So Function seems to be very simple. It has just values minus one, one, so. Um, um, it, it comes immediately into mind that because it looks simple, maybe its Fourier transform is very complicated. Um, and it's actually true, except for one obvious problem. For example, if you take f of x just equal to Putin, it has only one Fourier coefficient. So it's dictator function, and it has only one Fourier coefficient, so its Fourier transform is also very easy. Uh, so it has only this Fourier coefficient, which is equal to 1, and all other Fourier coefficients are zeros. So, but to, to understand our intuition that Fourier transform should be, should be uh, complicated, one should say the following. Suppose that this max inf is small. So th there is Maybe depending on f, maybe a degree of, uh, well, maybe I, I will give examples. So suppose it's, uh, it is small. So then this Putin is excluded, Hitler is excluded, Mussolini is excluded, and yes, the Fourier transform will be complicated. And uh, here, for example, the theorem of Bourguin. Uh, which sounds like that. So we have Boolean function with this equation. Uh, somehow we say that it's non in some some uh, way we, we sort of say that it's non-constant. And uh, then <coughs> if the influence, max influence, uh, yeah, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. So max influence. is, say, like that, where d is some large, large number. Uh, then the sum of the Fourier transform of the tail So if max influence, so fixed d, very, very large d, but you notice that estimates do not depend on n. There are no constant depending on n, on number of variables. So if max influence is this small, then the tail, the Fourier tail, so the uh, sum of squares of Fourier coefficients for, uh, for part where this uh, uh, set S is, is, has many elements, uh, uh, is, is this heavy. So let's read it in the opposite direction. So if this is not the case, then the, one of the influences should be large. 
Now, what does it mean what, when, when the, the tail is not heavy? For example, it's polynomial of degree d. If it's polynomial of degree d, then Fourier coefficients, or all such Fourier coefficients are zeros. OK? So for polynomial of degree d, one of the influences should be more than ex one of the ex some exponent, exponent to the power d, one tenth over d. And what it means, now we come to this uh, third topic, theoretical computer science. So what it means that one of the influences is large. Well, large is, everything is, you know, uh, relative. Uh, it, it doesn't look very large. It's uh, 10 to the minus d if it's uh, a polynomial of degree d. But uh, it, it, it says the following thing. I, I will wave hands. So there is one i with relatively large influence. So fix this guy. Just fix it. And consider now our function of other variables. It's still Boolean. So repeat the same argument, then repeat again the same argument. And after a certain number of steps, it turns out that you will need only like exponent to the power d steps uh, to prove that there is another polynomial. So start it with f, you will construct another polynomial such that L2 norm, well, here I should divide by epsilon, will be less than epsilon. And the main thing is that degree will be not, not large, but it's OK. The main thing that it will depend on few variables. It will depend on this number of variables. So original guy depends basically on infinitely number of variables because n is astronomically large. All estimates do not depend on n. And by this Bourguin theorem, just repeating, repeating, repeating it, you can prove that you can construct another function which is close to your function and which depends only on this number of variables. Uh, so such theorems are super uh, uh, popular in uh, theoretical computer science, and they are called Hunter theorems. Because you prove that um, so the, your f is basically the same as if it's ruled by finitely many, this number of people. So you can always think that this uh, Fs, especially when they are Boolean, uh, these are voting functions. So first vote plus one, second vote plus one, third vote maybe minus one, it's Trump or whatever, or Biden. Uh, Trump is minus one, Biden is plus one. And then F gives you, uh, if this scenario is uh, fulfilled, F gives you who won. And F can be complicated. For example, in, in United States, it's not majority function. So what is majority function? Majority x1, xn is just the sign of x1 plus z. Okay, so that's the usual a voting function, but they're more complicated. Voting function is just a Boolean function of Boolean variables, and n is 140 millions or 330 millions, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and there is one property. Uh, it should be monotone. If a certain string of x's, uh, it gives you one, then if another string of x's has more plus ones, then the previous one sh still should give you one, right? Because it's voting. So at least voting functions should have this problem. But anyway, so um, so this this theorem about Hunters uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of tells you that if your voting function is a polynomial of low degree, there will be always 
not too many people who will decide the outcome. The voting function should have very, very large degree to be fair. This one is, is very fair. Uh, actually, so all this, all this uh, thing about uh, the influence of max inf on the property of function have an interesting uh, corollary, which is a little bit uh, bad for democracy. It says, for example, that if you have a voting function and um, the <coughs> its average, meaning that you look over all scenarios, right, all possible x, yeah, its average, for example, is not minus one. Its average is minus one if it always gives you minus one, right? If it's not minus one, if it's bigger than minus 0 0.99, okay? Then this um, plus one guy can bribe approximately logarithm n voters to make average close to one. So very chilling theorem from social mathematics, very serious theorem actually, um, which says what I said, that uh, if, uh, if there are some amount of scenarios under which minus one doesn't, doesn't win, then plus one can bribe small o of voters and be very close to winning in, in average. Uh, okay, so this brings us to the last subject. So it turned out that it's possible to, to prove all kind of Hunter theorems and also learning theorem. So learning theorems are very close to Hunter theorems. They, they say something like that. Uh, invent the, the algorithm, uh, maybe probabilistic, such that you ask f and it, you give f the, 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 the argument, and it's honestly give you back f of x. So how many queries you should make to almost, to probably approximately correct get f. So what does it mean probably approximately correct? PAC, so given delta and epsilon with probability bigger than one minus delta, find by algorithm f tilde, such that f minus f tilde smaller than epsilon. And uh, I didn't explain, but this maxim gives junta and it gives certain way to, to make learning. But um, <clears throat> there is another way to make learning, also by harmonic analysis, but without using maxim. And uh, so it was first, uh, recently found by Eskenazis Ivanishvili, same Ivanishvili as, as here, it's my former student. And um, so what they used, they used Bonin blast Healy inequality. So what is Bonin blast Healy inequality? You have a function Again, we have the same setting, say bounded. Um, so then you can give this certain estimate on this Fourier coefficient, which is non-trivial. Uh, what would be the trivial one? So it's bounded, so it's an L2, because our measure is probability measure on this Hamming cube. So the sum of squares would be bounded trivially. But what it does, it says that if degree of f 
is less or equal than t, then you can give this estimate. Well, in our case, it's one, this is infinity, but it's scale, so okay. So it gives the LP, small LP estimate of Fourier coefficients if you have L infinity estimate in the physical domain. So this is born in blast Healy. It's uh, proved 70-something uh, years ago, published in Annals of Mathematics. And uh, so these uh, people invented how to use it for learning. Um, so how to invent algorithm to learn function efficiently with with small number of steps? Because the stupid way would be just give one ver one argument after another. Uh, there are two to the n arguments, and after two to the n two to the n queries, you will have uh, the answer. But uh, this probably approximately correct. Algorithm, given epsilon and delta, uh, gives um, gives number of queries. I mean, this algorithm, which uses Boolean blast Healy, uh, gives uh, the number of queries less than this constant c of d epsilon d plus one logarithm n divided by delta. So instead of two to the n queries, you have log log of two to the n queries. Okay? And um, <clears throat> so the question was, um, okay, this is how they learn the function very efficiently. Uh, what about learning the matrices? Um, you see, uh, this uh, Boolean stuff uh, extremely well uh, adapted to, to matrix, que to non-commutative questions. For example, this uh, epsilon i, which are plus minus one, instead can be a matrix, one of the Pauli matrices. So the simplest Pauli matrix is, of course, identity, but there is also this one, this one, uh, and this one. And instead of product, because we multiply these epsilons, you take tensor products in some order. And degree is how many non-trivial guys are there. So this is a trivial guy. It's like one, so we don't count it. And so degree, so everything is is uh, follows uh, same thing. Uh, we have a certain polynomial, a certain matrix, big matrix, and we say that degree of this matrix is smaller than d if decomposing the tensor products, all monomials have degree less or equal than d. And uh, all this, if you do it n times, so you consider two to, two to the n by two to the n matrices. Uh, so all these guys, if we in all order consider all of them, that will be a basis in matrices. So really, any matrix is a sum of such guys, or any matrix of this size. Uh, and so again, same question, but now this, these are coefficient in matrices, and you know, the, the proof didn't work. And so with, with my young co-authors, Joe Sloat and Aonan Zhang, uh, we did it. <clears throat> we proved bone blast hill inequality for matrices by reducing to a certain commutative case. So basically reducing to the previous case. but we invented how to reduce it. And then um, uh, Joe, who is uh, in theoretical computer science, he said, but there are other interesting basis of matrices. And um, 
when you go to so-called Heisenberg whale ba basis, very interesting also, but more complicated than this one, then you, you cannot reduce it to, to this bonin blast helium. You reduce it to another bonin blast helium inequality. So the bonin blast helium inequality, which looks like this. Uh, so instead of multiplying for, so I will give the, the simplest example. Instead of multiplying minus one, one n times, you multiply this triple n times. So what is omega? Omega is this primitive root of order three. Or you can do it for any n, not three. And so you, you consider now omega three to the power n, and you want bone and blast hill inequality. And you look at the proof, and you look and you get this inequality from the proof which people proved before you, but the difference is that instead of the, the product of these three guys, you need to consider the product of these triangles, convex hulls. Now, in the previous cases, it was the same supremum. Because if you take supremum over the product of these two points or the product of segments, it's the same thing because it's linear in each variable. So it's convex in each variable. So supremum over this or supremum over that, it's the same thing. Uh, and here, it's absolutely not the same thing. So very easy constructed counterexample. Uh, that uh, the, the, the supremum over this thing is not equal to supremum over this thing. So what, what you can do, you can, you can try to prove, uh, where they are, you can try to prove the following inequality. That supremum f of z, let me now use variable z because it's, it's in the complex plane, uh, omega 3 convex to the power n is less than, so degree again, uh, c of d, some other c of d, supremum f of z, d in just in order. Not, it should be independent of m. So such inequalities are, have name, it's called Remy's inequality where you are given function of some subset and you want supremum on the whole set. So, and I asked Chad GPT how to prove dimension-free Remy's inequality. And Chad GPT answered, it's a very difficult problem. You should start with learning the literature. Okay, I, I learned the literature. And there are many papers. Uh, and they all say that if you try to prove dimension three uh, Remy's inequality, you won't be able to do it because, because the constant uh, jumps up with exponentially with the dimension. Uh, and, and here we prove that in this very particular case, it doesn't. So um, I, 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 so what, what it is, on the right we have this triple times the same triple n times, etc. And here we have triangle, cross triangle, cross triangle, n times. And independent of n, this supremum will be bounded by this supremum uh, with constant, which is, um, <coughs> um, which is a c to the d squared some absolute constant c to the d squared. And uh, so, um, so that's it. And 
what I want, the last phrase is that I'm sure, but I cannot prove, that as soon as you just move any point, it, it will break down. So there will be no Remy's inequality if you just move one point. So it will be, but it will depend on n, as literature and chat GPT said. Thank you very much. Yeah, 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 you, yeah, of course, yeah. As soon as you change the point, you change the convex hull, uh, and still inequality should break down. I, it's my feeling. I, I, can, I cannot give counterexample, but uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the proof depended very much on this uh, arithmetic structure of, of points. Point in Blas Hilly, yeah. Uh, it is, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much for this question. Um, yes, yeah, so Hausdorff Young will be, if we have here norm, which is uh, LP1, well, this is P, and here we will have uh, L. E prime, and it would be true for any degrees. Well, it turns out that if you uh, make this assumption on degrees, your function is still extremely complicated because uh, how many monomials of degree d if you have n variables? Well, approximately n to the power d. So it's astronomical number of even, even for function which is homogeneous polynomial, uh, that would be very non-trivial inequality. And by the way, you cannot change this. So the smaller it is, the better. Because for L2 it's trivial. Well, it's written here. Uh, uh, L2 doesn't need even this degree. It's just always true. So, so the smaller the better. For example, if it would be 1, it's called um, Sidon constant. And Sidon constant must depend on n. Uh, there are works of people who made non-trivial proof uh, estimates in terms of n, but it must depend on n. Uh, but it turns out that for this one, uh, you can do something which is not dependent on n, and um, there is a certain non-trivial uh, sort of uh, probabilistic uh, argument which shows that this is the smallest uh, power which you can put here. So as soon as you try to do this power minus epsilon, that's not true. You, you can give some random counterexample. Uh, yeah. So, well, I love here that it's it's uh, typical harmonic analysis. One norm in the physical space, another norm in Fourier space, and you you want to estimate. And so, and then suddenly it has the applications to the learning of functions. So, 